studies in the marvelous book of Acts tonight, which takes us back to the Old Testament. One of the very clear things about the New Testament, it is built upon the Old Testament. And unless you understand what's going on in the Old Testament, many times you will not understand what is going on in the New Testament. The things which are referred to, the quotes which are made, which fulfill various prophecies that come out of the Old Testament are necessary to understand in their context. And so as we are here in Acts chapter 7 in Stephen's sermon before the Sanhedrin, shortly before his death, 
we find him making mention of perhaps the most important symbolic picture that God gave to Israel so that they might know about their coming Messiah. He gave it to them in detail. He gave it to them with precision. He told them exactly how it was to function, who was to function in it, the way in which the sacrifices were to be offered, who was holy and who was not holy, the days upon which the sacrifices would be offered, the times of days upon which the sacrifices would be offered, the different types of sacrifices which represented different things concerning our Lord Jesus Christ, the priesthood, its clothing, its music, everything that was to picture our Lord Jesus Christ was given to Israel as they left Egypt and began their wilderness wanderings. Would not have been wilderness wanderings except there had been this stubborn rebellious spirit that they had. But as they left Egypt, God gave to them his law and he gave them the tabernacle so that they might know about Christ, the one who fulfills the law. That they might know that someday there would be a new freedom in this promised eternal sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. We celebrated that this morning as we partook of the Lord's table together. We're in Acts chapter 7. I'll read verses 44 through 46. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen which also our fathers that came out after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us the tabernacle that we might know more about our Lord Jesus Christ, and that you held Israel accountable for knowing about Christ through the tabernacle. It's very clear as Stephen preaches this message that Israel was accountable for what you had revealed in pictures and in types and in symbols. You had given to them a living object lesson which they saw in the midst of the camp every day so that they might know something, in fact that they might know a great deal about the coming Messiah. And yet they hardened their hearts, they rejected it. O oh, Father, how much sore punishment are we to be thought worthy of if we ignore the much more clear revelation that has been given to us in the very Lamb of God himself being offered on Calvary's altar. We who have the revelation of the New Testament where it is clearly explained to us and yet we harden our hearts to our living Lord. We pray, Father, that as we study the tabernacle tonight, as we study the various instruments that were in the tabernacle, the various articles of furniture, the divine service that you established for the tabernacle, that we might be once again pointed to Christ, the one who is our great high priest, the one who is our sacrifice, the one who is pictured for us in the brazen altar and in the brazen laver, and in the golden candlestick, and as we shall see also in the table of showbread, and in the golden altar, and the one who is our mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, where his blood was shed once and for all. Father, we thank you for this, your word, and we pray for your blessings upon it tonight. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now last week we talked about the divine service in the tabernacle. In Hebrews chapter 9 verses 1 through 6 we read, Then verily the first covenant was also for also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick, and we have talked about that already, and the table, and the Lord willing, that's what we'll be talking about tonight, and the showbread which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was a golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubim of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service 
of God. Verse 1 speaks of the ordinances of divine service. Verse 6 speaks of accomplishing the service of God. The service of God and the ordinances of divine service. We have pictured for us here in the functioning of the tabernacle and later on in the temple, and we saw some of that last week as well. We have a picture of the way in which God has ordained worship. It gives to us a gorgeous picture that sets for us an example as to how worship should occur in the church. The Bible speaks of the word serve 193 times and service 116 times. There are related words that occur hundreds of times more as we saw it last week. And the Bible has much to say about humble service and work for God. And as we saw last week, it dealt with the work of the priests in the tabernacle and temple all the way down to the labors of the common man who brought his tithes of wheat and increase in service to the Lord. As we looked at the very, very many passages that we tried to cover briefly last week, we saw that the first way God calls or sends us to serve is in worship. God considers worship his principal means of serving him. We tend to think about serving God as we go out and pass out tracts, or serving God as we witness to somebody at our work, or serving God by coming and helping with the things at summer Bible school, or whatever else it is we do in the church, and those are indeed acts of service. But the first thing that is declared for us in Scripture as the service of God is divine worship. We find that established in Exodus chapter 12, verse 25. It shall come to pass, when ye come into the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep this service. That was the Passover. Exodus 12 is the Passover. And as we gathered today to remember the Lord's table, it was Passover that reminds us of the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was Passover when our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. He is, as Paul tells us, our Passover. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. As we come and gather to worship him, and particularly as we gather together at the Lord's table, this is considered by God to be a service. Unleavened bread in chapter 13, 5 is another of the feasts immediately preceding Passover, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. We saw that the purpose of the tabernacle was for the service of God, and all of its vessels were to be used in his service, all the vessels of the tabernacle in the service thereof. Exodus 36.3 speaks of the service of the sanctuary. We saw that the purpose of the great altar built by Manasseh and Gad was that they claimed their right to worship God with the rest of the tribes, even though they were on the other side of Jordan because of the greatness of their cattle. We saw that for us today, we are to be doing the service of God with goodwill. With goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men. We find that it was a picture for us, as Hebrews 9 explains, which was a figure, that is a typology, from which we learn, for the time present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make them that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience. What we see in the tabernacle is a picture, a type, and a figure of the way in which we are to serve God. We pointed out that the reason we call this the evening worship service and in the morning the morning worship service is because worship is our primary service to God. Worship service. Worship service. We learned many things, I'll just list them briefly, not covering the verses that we looked at. But holy service includes how we dress. I spoke on that in some detail this morning, though only very briefly. How we come into the presence of God. We talked about the work of the priests and how as they went about their service they must wear certain clothing, which was modest clothing, which was holy clothing. It's called the holy garments that were prepared for Aaron and his sons 
as they ministered in the tabernacle and then later on as we see all of the priests and the Levites ministering in service God ordained clothing that was modest that was beautiful and yet was not that of the world the service includes the music that we use it must be holy reverent and not in the carnal imitation of the world with religious words service we also saw included the mundane work that facilitates the worship things that we call like taking the offering or cleaning the church performing jobs of ushering or helping around in different other ways that facilitate the worship of believers who come to this place we saw that service includes the building and repair of the buildings used in the worship of God we saw that it included the work of the priests and ministers. We saw it included a distinct order for each person who is involved in that service. It included giving in worship, and that was called service to God. We saw that the church can learn from the worship of Israel in the service of God. In Romans chapter 9, verse 4, Paul makes a specific point of that. Our service also includes the presentation of our bodies as a living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Oh, I wish you would all memorize Romans 12, 1 and 2. And then as you meditate upon that, allow it to sink into your heart and recognize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that is why worship service takes place with our bodies as we serve Christ. We must not give service to other gods, and our service includes serving one another, and in that way, serving our Lord Jesus Christ. Now tonight, we want to look particularly at the table of showbread. The other items in the holy place, besides the golden candlestick, included two other things of major importance. There are also some small pans and snuffers and dishes and so on that were there that were uh, used, for example, in lighting the candlestick and in snuffing out those lights to refill the oil. Now, there were uh, items that were used at the table of showbread and lifting and turning, those, those flat things that we call pita. That was the showbread that was there. Now, there were certain things that were used in sprinkling the incense upon the golden altar of incense. But the three main items that were in the holy place in front of the veil before you would go on in to the holy of holies were the candlestick, as you're facing in, would be on your left-hand side. And as you're facing in, the table of showbread would be on your right-hand side. And directly in front of you would be the altar of incense, right in front of that veil behind which only the high priest could go once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And as we've pointed out, that forms a cross. As you start with the brazen altar, through the brazen labor, and down to the altar of incense, you have crossing that. You have the golden candlesticks and you have the table of showbread, which give us pictures of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we'll see tonight. As we move to that first inside part of the tabernacle, we move from brass to gold. Everything inside is made out of gold or wood overlaid with gold. It gives us a beautiful picture of moving from judgment into the holy presence of God and fellowship with him. And so tonight we look at the table of showbread. Literally the table or the bread of the faces. That's what this word means, the panim. It's the faces. It's bread that is offered before the very presence of God as we come in. It's also something that reminds us of Christ and of God's provision through Christ. <clears throat> the first bread that we see that is in the life of the children of Israel and which Jesus reminds them of in John chapter 6 is the bread that came down from heaven. That is manna, and of course we find a pot of manna as we move beyond the veil into the holiest of all. There was a pot of manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the law that were found, according to the book of Hebrews, in the Holy of Holies in the Ark of the Covenant. 
there was a bread that God had provided for them, which reminded them of the manna, the bread of heaven, in the wilderness. Hebrews speaks of that in Hebrews 9, verses 3 and 4. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. The bread, as we look at it, and as we begin, thinking first of the manna and then of the bread that is placed on the table, on the table of showbread, is a reminder that God is the one who provides our daily bread. Our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom this bread speaks, is the one who is our daily bread in the spiritual sense. But he told us that we are to pray that God would provide us with daily bread. You know the passage, Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. One of the things that we discover as we move through scripture is that God wants to self show himself strong on our behalf as we walk by faith. Give us this day our daily bread. God provides for us day by day the things that we need in that day. We tend to hoard. We tend to stock up. But as Jesus sent forth his disciples in Mark chapter 6 and verse 8, he commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no scrip, no bread, no money in their purse. He was teaching them to learn to rely upon him. Now here in the United States of America, we have a great deal of resources. We have the ability, at least at the present time, of storing up so that we can do our thing and not have to worry about the future. Believers in other parts of the world understand this portion of scripture a little bit better perhaps than we do because they live from day to day. They have to exercise a daily faith. They have to trust God for their daily bread. We find that the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15 and verse 17 began to realize how the father provided daily bread. When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. We have a heavenly father who provides us with daily bread. Not merely the physical bread that we eat and for which we are very thankful, and which we have an abundance each week on the table out here. Bread products of some sort, many times things that we delight to have. But this young man realized that even his father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and he says, I perish with hunger. Jesus was teaching lessons about a prodigal. He was teaching lessons about a father. He was teaching lessons about an older brother. He was teaching lessons about servants. But sometimes we overlook the fact that he's the one that provides the daily bread. And for us, likewise, as we move into each new day, he renews our strength. He gives us the grace for the day. He provides us with the bread of life, his word, so that we might learn and that we might grow, which is one of the things that bread helps you to do. This, of course, speaks of Christ, who is the bread of life. John 6, verse 35 and verse 48, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. And then down in verse 48, he emphasizes it once again. I am the bread of life. Bread is connected to life. Physical bread will keep you alive. But Jesus himself is the bread of life. As we look at the table of showbread, as we enter that tabernacle and look to our right and see this beautiful table with a golden crown around it, standing there with its loaves of bread placed on the table, we are to remind it that Christ himself is the bread of life. We are in the tabernacle. It is a tabernacle of witness. 
It is a tabernacle that points to Jesus. It also speaks of a particular type of bread. For the bread that was placed on the table of showbread was unleavened bread. It speaks thus of Christ who is the sinless one, the unleavened bread. You see, it was the feast of unleavened bread that preceded Passover. He was the one who would provide himself as the Passover. And so as we read in each of the Gospels on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? Oh, as we move through the feasts of Israel, we move also through the work of Christ. The unleavened bread which was placed fresh each day on the golden table inside the tabernacle speaks of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is unleavened. He is without sin. He is fresh to us every day. He is the one who will also be our Passover lamb. The bread also speaks of the body of Christ in which he bore our sins on the cross. We read that this morning as we read from the Gospel of John, but it's also found in Matthew and Mark and Luke. In Matthew we read, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. In Mark 14, And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And of course we read the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which also quotes these words of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're inside the tabernacle. We're looking at the unleavened bread. We're looking at our Lord Jesus Christ, the bread come down from heaven. Christ, the one who is the sinless one. Christ, who bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead unto sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Christ, the bread of life, giving his life that we might live. Taking death upon himself that we might have life in him. The bread also reminds us of who Jesus is and what he did. It points us back as well as pointing us forward as we always note on Communion Sunday. But it reminds us when we are not walking by faith of who he is and what he did. You recall the narrative in Luke chapter 24. The crucifixion has taken place. Three days have gone by. The resurrection has occurred and the women have brought the news to the disciples and the disciples have checked it out and they have found it to be true. And yet there are two lonely followers of Jesus walking home and doubting. And Jesus draws near to them. How often I picture myself as those two doubting and walking away from Jerusalem. And he says, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, what did he do? He expounded the scriptures to them. He opened their understanding. He showed how the Bible pointed to him. The things concerning himself. And they got to Emmaus, and Jesus made as though he would go on. And they said, oh, don't do that. Please come inside and have dinner with us. It's late, and we'd love to share a meal with you. It's been a wonderful blessing to hear you talk about the Bible. They opened their homes. You know, folks, you never know what you're missing when you fail to exercise hospitality. Oh, 
though you have the gift of hospitality, it is a spiritual gift. Those of you who remember our studies in the spiritual gifts on Wednesday evening five years ago, what you would miss for failing to exercise hospitality. Think about Abraham and Sarah as they prepared a meal for the Lord and the two angels who would destroy Sodom. Think about hospitality as Lot brought the two angels into his home. What would these men have missed had they failed to exercise hospitality? What would the two on the road to Emmaus have missed if they failed to exercise hospitality? We're told that those who exercise hospitality sometimes entertain angels unawares. We keep our homes so closed. But they invited Jesus in. And he sat down at the table. And normally it would be the hosts who would offer the blessings and who would serve the food by breaking the bread. But Jesus offers the blessing and it says he broke the bread and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. And they returned with haste to Jerusalem. They went to the apostles and they said, the Lord has appeared to us. And they say, yeah, he's appeared to Peter too. And he said, he was known in the breaking of the bread. The bread is a reminder to us. Do you think of that each time you eat bread? We think of it so lightly, so cheaply. We can buy it for less than a dollar a loaf. We sit down there, we spread it with our peanut butter and jelly or whatever you put on bread. As you look at the bread, I hope you will never look at it again without thinking of Christ, who is the bread of life, who has not only provided for your physical needs, but who is the bread of life, who has given you life, the bread come down from heaven, that he might give life to the world. He was known unto them in the breaking of the bread. Luke 24, 35, they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. The breaking of bread is used as a figure of speech all through the New Testament to speak of the Lord's table. You see, when we are breaking bread with one another, we are speaking of the one who has provided our salvation. Jesus explains that in his earthly ministry as he is walking on the other side of the sea, he has performed the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. He's disappeared and the crowd has found him at last. They followed him. John chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, whence camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. That was the best bread they ever ate in their life. Some of you know what homemade bread is like. You know what it's like when it comes right out of the oven and you put a big slab of butter on it and nothing else and you, you taste that rich, fresh, delicious flavor of bread. That's stale bread compared to the bread Jesus gave them. Christ, the creator of the universe, had multiplied the loaves and the fishes and he had given them bread like they'd never had before. It was to tell them that he himself was the bread like they'd never had before. Nothing that could satisfy like he could satisfy. He knows why they came. They didn't care about spiritual things. In fact, he says so. They only cared about temporal things. Labor, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth into everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you, for him hath God the Father sealed. They don't get it. So they ask him a question, well, okay, if you're not going to give us bread, tell us the secret. How do you do it? 
Here's their question in the next verse. They said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? That was really good, Jesus. And you know, uh, hey, we want to be good followers of you. What do we do that we can work the works of God? That would really be nice, not to have to go down to the baker every day and buy bread. We would like to be able to do that. And you know, catch one fish. Hey, don't have to worry about going fishing ever again. We can multiply fish that way. What might we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus doesn't give them a temporal answer. He gives them an eternal answer. Then Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. Two very interesting things in that verse. Number one, faith is the work of God in your heart. Number two, we are accountable for it in terms of how we respond when we hear the word of God. But you believe on him whom he has sent. They said, therefore, unto him, they don't get it still, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? In other words, it's time for lunch again. Let's see it again. We, we You know, we... Kind of fo foggy, that, that thing you did yesterday. Let, let us see something else. How often we as people fail to trust, to believe, to walk by faith. What do they point back to? Oh, they point back to what was going on in the wilderness. You see, when we're inside the tabernacle, that showbread could only be eaten by the priests. But God was going to provide bread for all of the people. And so that's what they remember. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Boy, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah, bread. Old Testament, manna. They got it every day. God gave it to them from heaven. Okay, Lord, if you can make bread like that, we'll settle for that too. Manna from heaven, please. Lord, give us this bread. They didn't get it. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Do you know what their response was? It tells us in verse 41. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Now we didn't like that answer. We want something else. Don't you get it, Jesus? You made bread yesterday. We're asking you for a miracle today. We reminded you how God provided bread every day for us Jewish people wandering through the wilderness. Get it? You know. Bread yesterday, so today, new day, every day, we're coming to you for a free lunch. How often we think like temporal carnal bums on welfare. We have a Heavenly Father who provides for us, but the provision that He makes for us is through work. If any will not work, neither shall He eat. They were looking for temporal bread. Jesus is providing us with eternal bread every day as we come to him in our spiritual growth. We move down to verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. And then he reminds them something very important. If all you're looking for is temporal bread, you're going to get the consequences of that which is temporal. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness. And he has three words. And are dead. 
Oh, how we push for the things of this life instead of pushing for the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that it man may eat thereof and not die. He's offering bread that gives eternal life. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give, will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. You know, folks, we often listen with the wrong ears. The Jews clearly listened with the wrong ears. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They thought Jesus was talking about cannibalism. Now, you know, people come to the Bible, and there are many people who come to the Bible and get some very weird ideas. This, I think, is one of the weirdest ideas that anybody ever got, hearing the very word of God spoken by the Son of God himself. They thought that Jesus was talking about cannibalism. You know, I suspect that each one of us comes to Scripture at some time, and because we come with a preconceived notion or a preconceived desire of what we want, therefore we come to conclusions that are not based really upon the text. We need to come to Scripture with an open heart and willingness to say to God, if you will teach me something from your word, I'm looking for bread. And we'll see in a few moments that the Scripture or that the bread of life also speaks of the scripture. As we come, we're not coming demanding a certain type of meal. We're coming and asking him to give us his bread and cause us to grow in the way that he chooses to be the right way for our growth. Don't come and put your preconceived notions on God's word. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so that he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore many of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is an hard saying, who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Now he explains to them, he gives them the key of what he means by him, Jesus, being the bread of life that came down from heaven. This is the key verse to this entire passage. This is what the Jews did not understand. Verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. He wasn't talking about temporal bread. He wasn't talking about cannibalism. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that should believe not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Election is very clearly taught by our Lord Jesus Christ in this passage. Unless the Father draws, unless the Spirit gives life, a man will not be saved. And that is, in fact, the doctrine that drove away many who had followed him to this point. The very next verse says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Peter got it. I am.
am the bread of life. I am the bread that came down from heaven. Peter understood. Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. We mentioned a few moments ago about how bread speaks of the body of Christ during the memorial of the Lord's table. That was the regular practice of the church, and we pointed out that it is a phrase, the breaking of bread, that is often used in the New Testament. Let me just give you a few of those references. Starting in Acts 2, 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. You've been with us on Sunday evening when we talked about those four elements of worship which are so essential to the body of Christ. They continued, here's another one, they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They were having fellowship with one another in the breaking of bread. It reminded them as they ate together of that last supper when they ate with Christ. Do you know that that is one of the purposes of hospitality? Is the breaking of bread to remind us as we fellowship together that Christ is the head of this home. Christ is the host at this table. Christ is the one around whom we gather as believers and he is the one that provides our commonality. Hospitality. Again in chapter 20 and upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. They've gathered to break bread, but it's also a time where the word is going forth. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Oh, you know the story of Eutychus. Young man, gets a little bit tired. Paul was a long preacher. I preached 15 minutes too long this morning. Paul preached until midnight. Now, find yourself a cushion around there somewhere in the pews. <laughs> No, I'm not going to preach to midnight, I don't think, unless the Spirit of God, by supernatural means, moves me to do so. Paul preached to midnight, and Eutychus was sitting up in the upper loft uh, in a window, trying to get some fresh air, and there were a lot of candles and lights in the room where they were preaching, and probably there was a, a little bit of a lack of oxygen up there at the top, and began to get drowsy, and he fell out of the window, and they took him up dead. And as you know, God provided a miracle through the Apostle Paul and he fell upon him and he said he's okay, picked him up. Eutychus shook his head a little bit perhaps and walked back in, probably felt a little bit embarrassed uh, that he had broken up the middle of the service, gave everybody a moment to relax and now we're back to preaching again. And it tells us, when therefore he was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. But in the middle of that, they broke bread together. That's the Lord's table. Chapter 27, we find Paul on board a ship in the midst of a storm. Everybody is terrified and fearful for their lives, and the angel stands next to Paul and tells him, everybody's going to get saved on this ship, 276 souls. Save the big ship. Huge storm. And Paul, in joy and gladness, in the middle of the storm, what does he do? He stands up and tells them the new revelation that God has given to him about every man and woman and child aboard that ship. And then what does he do? When he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Christ, our Deliverer. The bread who is our deliverer in the storms of life, when the crisis moments come upon us and when there is fear and pressure and despair, despair even of life. We find it's used this way in the doctrinal epistles. Oh, the picture that's given to us here, purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as ye are unleavened 
For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Let us therefore keep the feast not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Remember what Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Paul is not merely talking about keeping an Old Testament feast. And many people go to the scriptures and they try to keep all of the Old Testament feasts and, you know, go through the Jewish rituals and all this kind of stuff. Many who call themselves Christians, among the Messianic Jews especially, do this. But others who are in cultic and apostate groups try to do it as well. The words that I speak unto you, Jesus says, they are spirit and they are life. Paul says the same thing here in 1 Corinthians in chapter 5 when he speaks of purging out the old leaven, of being a new lump, of being unleavened, of Christ as a Passover, at keeping the feast, not with old leaven of malice and wickedness. Leaven speaks of sin, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Chapter 10, verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Communion, fellowship. You heard or read my letter, the communion letter that is sent out each time that we have communion here. And we talked about what that means in terms of fellowship and how we're having fellowship with one another and with God the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ, as the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. And then the passages in chapter 11, which we've read already, where he speaks of the bread and of the cup. Let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. When we partake of the bread, it reminds us of the body of Christ in which he bore our sins. We need to come with holy hands and a pure heart. But the bread also reminds us of the return of Christ. Verse 26 of chapter 11 1 Corinthians, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. You see, the bread gives us many aspects of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. It reminds us of things past. It reminds us of things future. It reminds us of the fellowship that we are to have one another. And Paul explains that in relation to believers in the body of Christ. Just as Christ is the light of the world, we are also lights that are supposed to be representing Him. And the same is true of the bread. 1 Corinthians 10.17 For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Did you ever stop to think? I'm sure you've thought of yourself as being a light that Christ has set here in this world of darkness. But do you ever think of yourself because you are part of the body of Christ, you are part of the one bread. What did Christ take and do with the bread? He broke it into pieces. And then he did something with it in the feeding of the 4,000 and in the feeding of the 5,000. He broke it into pieces and then he gave it to the disciples and the disciples gave it to the multitudes. We being many are one bread and one body for we are all partakers of that one bread. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But it also speaks of how God has provided food for the priesthood, especially as we're looking at the table of showbread. 1 Peter 2.9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and we talked a bit about the priesthood of the believer this morning, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The table of showbread contained bread that was eaten by the priests. You are a royal priesthood, according to Peter. We also saw multiple passages in the book of Revelation where it talks about us being priests unto God. It was holy bread that only the priests could normally eat because it was for those who were sanctified. This comes out as we look at the narrative of David coming as he's fleeing from Saul and coming, coming to the priests of Nob. 
and asking if the priest has anything that David can have for himself and for his young men who are with him who have not eaten. In 1 Samuel 21, 4 and 5, the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under mine hand, but there is hallowed bread, if the young men have kept themselves at least from women. And David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. He's talking about the bread that was on the table of showbread. And as you know, the priest gave him the bread, and Jesus makes reference to that in the New Testament. Because you see, it was provided for those who had been set apart. And Jesus speaks of himself as providing himself as the bread that gives life to the world. It also speaks both of the living Christ, the living word, and the written word. We see Jesus using it that way, speaking of bread in Matthew chapter 4 and the temptation in the wilderness. Then Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The bread is parallel to the written word of God. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God would even have included the words that Jesus was spoken, speaking at that moment to Satan himself. There is the living word, there is the written word. And it is a reminder that God gives good things to his children. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? He gives us bread. He doesn't give us rocks. He gives us bread. It's a reminder that God's hand is not shortened as we look at the providing for his children, the 4,000, the 5,000, plus the women and the children, Matthew 15:33. Oh, the disciples doubted. They say, we're in the wilderness. Can we find enough food to fill such a great multitude? But it's a reminder that it is God who has given us his bread to provide supernaturally for others. We partake of it, yes, but we are to give it to others. Mark 6, 37, he answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread and give them to eat? And his disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? The answer is, No man could do it. But Jesus could. But Jesus didn't go around and pass it out to the five thousand. He gave it to the disciples. And they gave them bread to eat. We often think of that as the responsibility merely of the pastor. But you know, dear friends, each one of us has been given the living word of God. Ye are my witnesses. And that comes down to us today as we see our responsibility, and we talked about that as we were looking at Acts chapter 1. The responsibility not only of the apostles, but of those who would commit the same things to faithful men who would be able to teach others also down to each one of us who are believers sharing the bread of life. It all brings us back to that bread that God provided in the wilderness, both for the people in the manna and the bread of the presence, the showbread in the tabernacle, a holy bread, for those who are priests, and you and I are priests unto our God. Bread also speaks either of the doctrine of Christ or of poisonous bread, which is false doctrine. When his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. 
Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye so among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not understand, neither remember the five loaves and the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that ye do not understand that I spake not to you concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then they understood how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Bread starts somewhere, though. Bread starts as grain. Bread starts as a grain of wheat, which is ground and pulverized and finally made into a loaf, either with or without leaven. It reminds us of that bran of wheat that is pulverized in the mill of suffering and subject to the fire of divine judgment for sin, and Christ portrays himself that way. John 12, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Three verses later, Jesus says, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I into this hour. Christ the bread come down from heaven, the grain of wheat that falls into the earth and dies, that goes through the troubling and the suffering of the cross, that brings about ultimately for those who will not partake of the bread of life, the judgment of God. Four verses later, Jesus says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. You're in the tabernacle that points to Christ. You've come past the brazen altar. You've come past the brazen labor. You've come in to the tabernacle of witness itself. You've seen the golden candlesticks and Christ, the light of the world, and you as lights that reflect him. And to your right, you see the golden table of showbread with the unleavened bread placed upon it fresh every day, which speaks of him and speaks of your responsibility to share him with the world. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that Jesus Christ is the bread come down from heaven. How we thank you that Jesus is the bread of life that gives life to the world. How we thank you for the beautiful picture and the way in which bread is used in the New Testament to speak of our Lord's body, to speak of his death upon Calvary's cross where he bore our sins. How bread is used to speak of us as part of the body of Christ. As he is the one bread, so also we are bread, which is part of that one bread. We are in fellowship with him as we walk in the light. We are in fellowship with him as day by day we partake of his word, that bread, which you have given to us for our spiritual growth. And the tabernacle tells us thus about Jesus our Savior. How we thank you in his precious name. Amen.